Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for His presence I feel tonight. Amen. Amen. I'd like you to take your Bibles and go with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm going to read just the first part of what is here listed as verse 33. I, uh, the last part of this verse, I am of the opinion that it should go with the following verse, verse 34, and is, is much more connected to that than it is to the statement that is made in verse 33. I'd give explanation of that in, in prior sermons, and I hope it's alright. I'm going to read verse 33, just the first part of it this evening, and I'm going to read it without the italics, or the words in italics as they are it truly really gives the better sense of it. The words in italics are not in the original, and I would just like to read it without them if I might hear this evening, so we may just get the sense of what the Apostle said. Simple statement, simple declaration. For God is not of confusion, but of peace. For God is not of confusion but of peace. That's a simple declaration Paul makes. It's that simple. It's the way it was in the Greek. God, for God, is not of confusion, but of peace. Would you say amen to God's Word tonight? You may be seated. I I thank you for being here. I thank you for putting forth an effort to be here. Though you may be tired and... I know, and Brother Emery especially, and, and, and things that he's been through with, I just want to say thank you for being here and putting forth the effort. And I also appreciate not just an effort to be here, but an effort to put in something after you get here. I appreciate that. It's one thing to get here. It's another thing to do something after you get here. And I want you to know that I appreciate it. When you put forth that extra effort with that tired body to focus that mind and say, God, help me tonight to, to uh, hear from you and to, to give all that I've got unto you so that you, Lord, might be able to use me. Amen. I want to share with you tonight from this passage. I do not know if I will uh, complete my thoughts because there are some things that I wish to uh, kind of hone in on because it's hard for me to go to this passage and not... Uh, directly address the context of this Scripture here this evening. I do want to just give just a second, if I might, uh, a little bit of a background and what really brought this to me. It was, we were in the, the city of, um, I believe it in English would be called uh, Prosperity, but I think it was Prosperidad, but Prosperity in uh uh, Mexico, now about 45 minutes from Rio Bravo. We went to visit a church on a Saturday morning. Uh, rode a school bus over there. Uh, looked through the, uh, the countryside, witnessed the countryside. Got there was a day that was rather warm and uh, near, near the border. We, we, we got there that morning and uh, had service. Brother Emery preached in the uh, morning service. It was supposed to be a youth service and... Uh, he, he plowed the ground pretty deep, plowed a pretty deep furrow, and I don't think that ground had been broken up in so long, you wouldn't even know it was a field that ever had anything planted in it. It was just a good hard soil, unbroken ground, and, and, uh, and he plowed it up pretty deep and shared with these. These were young folks that were, uh, uh, at least in terms of, uh, some connection or, or some understanding, I suppose, of, of, uh, of Pentecost, but had far Far left holiness. And I'll be honest with you, uh, unless you get connected with holiness, you can't get connected to true Pentecost. Now, that's just the way that I believe it to be tonight, because you can't get to Pentecost unless you go by Calvary, and you can't get to Calvary unless you go by Sinai. That's just the way that it is. You need to feel the law of God and the condemnation of God. That'll bring you to Calvary. And, and then once you get to Calvary, you can see the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and see your need to be thirsty. 
entirely cleansed and purged from your sins. And it's then you can make a trip to Pentecost to get the power that comes from on high. Amen. But don't look for that power and don't look for that strength until you've first found the purity and the holiness of, of, of Calvary. And don't look for the purity of Calvary until you've felt the condemnation of Sinai. And once you've felt the condemnation of the law of God that has come down upon your life, then you can see and respect and appreciate the mercy of God that is shown to us at Calvary. And then you'll have a hunger of God for the power that flows from the power of the Spirit of the living God. And Brother Brother Emery plowed up some ground in holiness that morning. And uh, we got back there and I'm I'm thinking, wow, this afternoon is nowhere going to be the way I'd planned to go because it was just a whole different atmosphere and a different spirit. I think folks were kind of struggling over what Brother Emery had shared with them. And and, uh, I got in there the afternoon and lo and behold, in the afternoon service, came this uh, couple of young men leading service and or leading the singing. And uh, they I think they'd have been as home uh, uh, at home in a, uh, a rock concert or a ballroom as they were in a church service. I, I don't think that anybody uh, that their music would have been out of place any more in a ballroom than it was in that church. Uh, uh, it probably been in place rather in a ballroom. But nevertheless, it was loud. It was rockish. And I was about uh, maybe six seven feet from the speaker and it, it got so bad I had to go outside for a little while it was about to blow my eardrums to pieces and uh, uh, nobody, other folks that used to it didn't seem to mind it but I minded it and a couple of our ministers Brother Davis Brother Embry they hit their knees in the altar and started praying and I'm sitting there thinking i got to preach after this mess i got to get up here and say something and, and teach after this junk and what am I going to do and well I pulled an Elisha on him first thing I did is when I got up to that uh, up to that pulpit I just didn't say anything Thing for just a few minutes, and I, I was so rattled by everything, I just let everything kind of settle for a little bit. You know, after you get all that rattling going on, I just let the dust kind of settle down. Then I pulled in Elisha. When Elisha saw Jehoshaphat and, and the king of uh, Israel and Moab come in, he saw that the, the good king and he's mixing company with this evil king. It just rattles his cage. And he, you know, they come in, they want a word from God. And first thing he says is, Bring me a minstrel. Man, I, I can't even give these folks a word from God. I, I need to get settled down because I don't like the sight of seeing this mixture in the house of God or, or God's servant, Jehoshaphat, uh, to be a, a good and righteous king. And here he is in company and, 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 and allying himself with wicked kings and kings that don't know God. And I'll tell you, the righteous don't have any business holding hands with the wicked, and that's just the way that it is. It's an ungodly alliance. It's an unequal yoke, and it's not something that ought to be. And it's so rattled Elisha's cage. He said, bring me a minstrel. I need, I need someone to play, and then I'll prophesy. I get a word from God, but sometimes you just got to get yourself settled down before you can hear from God. So I got up there and God had begun to deal deal with me about this. And the first thing I did is I I said, I pulled an Elisha on them. I said, we're going to sing. And I knew a little Spanish chorus that we sang here in America. And I said, I don't know if you know it, but if if you're not, it's real simple. You can learn it. I said, we're not going to have any music. I want to hear the sweet sound of the voices in this congregation and no music. And I, I, I reproved them a bit for their music. Music and its loudness and their dependency upon it and uh, and uh, some things about that. So I, I admonished them there a little while and then uh, we sang a song. And you know what? You could really feel the sweet presence of God. There were some good folks that were there and when folks just sang and weren't distracted by all that loud uh, music, then it, it just brought a sense of calm. And then in that calm and in that sense of receptiveness, we could share with them what God had laid on my heart. And, and this was the thought that God had given me: that God is a peace and not of or God is not of confusion, but He is a God of peace. He is not of confusion, but He is peace. And what I felt in that in that uh, midst of that church that day was this business of confusion. And I want to explain that just for a moment. In the in the word, this Greek word here is is not uh, the word that we would really initially translate as confusion. It's something that brings confusion, but it is better translated tumult. Other places in the Scripture, it is translated tumult or disorder. Confusion is the result of disorder. When you have tumult, when you have chaos, then you have confusion. When you have disorder and things are out of sync, then you have confusion. And the idea here is that God is not of tumult. Notice the the opposites here that He gives. That's why I say the tumult, again, is the better translation. God is not of tumult, 
but of peace. Not is not of disorder, but of peace. Peace is that which is unity, which is harmony. But confusion is the result of tumult or that of disorder. And I felt a lot of disorder in that place that day. I felt a lot of tumult and a lot of things that were just kind of out of sync and, and, and in the wrong kind of order. And, and, and that's not of God. That, that business is not what God's about. God's about, a, uh, He's a God of order. He's a God that puts things in sync. He's a God that harmonizes things. It's sin that gets our lives out of order. It's sin that makes our lives a wreck. It's God that puts us back in the kind of condition that He meant for us to be originally in the beginning. And I just began to think about that, and I preached on it that afternoon. I'm not going to go the same direction I did there, different applications, but uh, I, I, want to, I want to deal with that principle here tonight and begin to share with you some things about this business of uh, tumult and disorder. And just let me preface by saying that what God wants to do and what I have found that God has been doing in my life is that He has been ordering my life. He's been putting it together. We, I don't think sometimes we recognize how much sin affects us and how much that sin really disorganized and disordered our lives and brought tumult and chaos. There's a world out there in chaos. And I'm not just talking about wars and rumors of wars. I'm talking about people in their own personal lives. Our homes are out of order. Our country is out of order. Cultures are out of order. Colleges and universities are out of order. Marriages are out of order. Churches are out of order. Individual lives are out of order. And there is no peace. But there's one way you can have peace. And that's get things back in the order that they ought to be. And the only way to have that is have Jesus Christ, the King and the Shepherd of your soul. Because our God is a God that puts things in sync. He harmonizes your life. And what we need, sin disjoints us. It puts everything in disarray. Confuses it complicates it, makes a mess out of it. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes God can't order a life overnight. He corrects root issues first. He gets someone that first of all got to convert and surrender control to Him and give over the control of their life to Jesus Christ and then He begins to order the steps of that man. He begins to direct the life. He begins to show Him the things He needs to take off and the things that He needs to put on. He begins to show him what things are inconsistent in his life and things that are out of harmony with the character and the nature of God. And I'm going to tell you, the more you live for Jesus and the closer you get to Jesus, the more you're going to find a sweet peace and harmony in your soul and the simpler your life is going to become and the more orderly your life is going to become. Our life should not be a life of chaos of up and down and in and out. Our life should be a life that is ever growing in greater peace and greater harmony and greater order because our God is in control. It's a contradiction of courage to have God in control of the house and that house be a house of chaos and tumult. And I want to, I want to share with you about that principle. But first of all, I'm going to address the context in which this verse is given because I think that that's important for us to understand that context. I never like to divorce a, a passage from its context, but I'm going to deal with the, the context first of all for a little while tonight, and then if I have time, I'm going to move on to that order or that principle itself of order and peace and, and, and how that comes into our life and how that God puts our life into order and some of the things that need to be done. Paul has come to this place in 1 Corinthians 14. It's, it's a, a passage, I, I suppose, maybe misunderstood by many. I know that there are, are many non-Pentecostals that don't understand the passage. And, and uh, I, I say, I will preface to say that, that, you know what? If you've never had the Pentecostal experience, if your church has never seen any exercise of the gifts, if your church has never seen what tongues and interpretation is, your church has never experienced the gifts in any shape or form, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to grasp First Corinthians chapter 14. You're not going to get a hold of it. You're going to come out wrong every time. It's like a man who doesn't know anything about salvation. Trying to understand John chapter 3. Trying to put it into context and he's never been born again. He's never, he's never known what it is to, to have a new birth. 
I mean, you're not, you're not going to go into this book and understand the rudimentary principles that need to be understood unless you have had an experience with God that can bring you that knowledge and that kind of an understanding. And, and, and there are a lot of folks that enter into 1 Corinthians 14. I've read commentaries, different commentaries by, by, by men of different backgrounds. And I can tell you, a lot of them spit out the same thing. But they're talking about something they have no idea and no clue what's going on. Because they've never had the baptism of Holy Ghost in their experience. And apart from that experience, you're going to struggle in your understanding of what was happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So I preface it by saying that. I do want you to understand that it is this church, of course, there are difficulties, there are things that are going on that Paul has to rights to correct, and that uh, these folks consider themselves to be spiritual. There's a need there today, and I'm probably not going to get beyond this because it's so important for me to deal with this context before I get to the principle and and, and deal with the principle in that context. But I, I want you to understand that this term spiritual, I, that's really just come home to me more and more in this day, in this hour, because that is the need of the hour. Because the need of the hour is spiritual men and women. We have good men. We have good women. We have, we have good children. But we need spiritual men and spiritual women and spiritual children. We need to go beyond just living right. We need to go beyond just being good and doing good. We need to have power. We need to have discernment. We need to be men who can have insights into the Word and to what God is doing into this world because our battle is not a physical battle, although it involves physical things. It is a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We are fighting an enemy we can't even see. We're struggling with powers and forces that you and I cannot place a hand on and touch with a hand. And I'm telling you, we need spiritual insight. Now understand that that word spiritual was not an Old Testament term. Spirit is present in the Old Testament. Spirit moved upon men, but men were not considered spiritual. Men prophesied. But spiritual is a New Testament term. It's something that comes about in the New Testament. It is a post-Pentecostal term. It is a post-Pentecost term that applies to men and women who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and have gained that kind of insight into the nature and the experience of God because God is spirit. And I can tell you, it is a tremendous experience in your life when you become filled with God. More than simply having God in your life. More than simply knowing God dwells in your vessel. Having that Holy Spirit fill your vessel is an experience that takes you deeper and brings you to a sense of spirituality. And as you grow in that and exercise your senses in the Word of God and the Spirit transforms you and changes you into the image of Jesus Christ, you become a man or a woman who has insights and can discern in situations. You will see things that other people will not see. You will feel things that other people will not feel. I'm not getting out in the far left field here. I'm just showing you that's the way it is. Elisha stood there and his servant says, hey, there's more against us than there are for us. Oh no, there's not. He saw something that that servant did not see. And that's the way spiritual people are. They see things. They behold things. They understand things. They grasp things that the world and the carnal people cannot grasp and understand. And I'm telling you, that's the need of the hour. Now, these people felt we are spiritual. But they weren't quite as wise in their spirituality as they thought they were. They demonstrated quite a bit of carnality, as a matter of fact, and a lack of wisdom. And uh, there were flaws in their thinking, uh, particularly in regards to the manifestation of the Spirit. Now, I'm just going to take you through a little bit here, if I can, tonight. Let's back up, please, to chapter 12, and I'll, I'll try to... Help me, Spirit of the Lord, please, tonight to take this in, 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 the, in the orderly fashion. But I, I want to be able to not get hung up here, but I want to kind of give a little overview of where Paul was going here. If we go to chapter 12 and verse 1, and he says, Now concerning spiritual. We note the word gifts is in italics. Again, indicating it is not in the original. He is not particularly here referring just to gifts, but to spiritual principles, to spiritual things. It's literally the word is spirituals. Now concerning spirituals, brethren, which could apply to spiritual gifts, spiritual things, spiritual people, spiritual uh, 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 events or, or, or manifestations of the Spirit. In other words, Paul is dealing with things of the Spirit. 
And concerning things of the Spirit, he talks about what they were. They were Gentiles. They were carried away unto dumb idols, even as they were led. Now, what you're going to find out in these next verses, or, 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 or these next chapters, particularly in chapter 14, and emphasizes again in chapter 12 and, and chapter 13, there becomes a focus in chapter 14 and a regulation. God brings some order in the assembly of the saints, particularly in reference to speaking gifts. And that is that of tongues and interpretation and prophecy. And the emphasis in these passages, because that's where the problem's more, they're having a greater struggle in, in their uh, working in cooperation with the Spirit, is this uh, in, in reference to the speaking gifts. Because understand something, you and I are not filled with the mere influence. We are not filled with a feeling. We are not filled with just some euphoria. We are filled with a person who has language, who has personality, who has intelligence, intellect, who has will, who has desire, and who seeks to express himself through the vessel in which he lives and dwells. You understand the gods they used to serve were dumb idols. The gods they used to serve were idols that could not speak. They were made of wood. They were made of stone. They could not speak. They could not express themselves in the lives of the people. It was nothing more than the energy, the effects, and the efforts of that person who was worshiping because that idol could not produce anything in the life of that person because it was dumb. It could not speak. It could not live. It could not talk. But I'm telling you the God we serve lives, speaks, and talks. Hallelujah. He is not a God who is uh, uh, dumb in that sense. And the word dumb here does not mean stupid. It means mute, one who cannot talk. And the, and the idea here is that our God is not dumb. There was a time we were led away to speechless idols, but now we are led to a God who speaks and talks. And we need to understand some things about that God. Now, this emphasis here, the regulations that are going to come, and that's important to remember on reference to speaking gifts. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, miracles and faith and healings were not regulated. He did not say you can only have three miracles of service. He did not say only four people can get healed. If you've got 150 folks and they need healing, let God heal them and let the Spirit of God move and let them all get healed. There were no regulations. The regulations were only in reference to the speaking gifts. That's all it was done. And he, he begins by letting them know there was a time. Your idols didn't do it. Just coming out of your own heart. Those idols weren't speaking. It was just you speaking. But now we got a different situation. we got the Holy Ghost in you. we got you in the Spirit of God. And we got the Spirit of God in you. You in Jesus. Jesus in you. And now there is some responsibility with the things that we say. Because inevitably, we are connected with a God who talks. Matter of fact, this book we have is called His Word. Because our God speaks. And he talks about, I'll give you to understand, and he lets him know right away that if there's a man speaking, that there's no way that if he is speaking by the Spirit, that he's ever going to trust Jesus. There's no way he's going to denounce Jesus or, or, or to blaspheme that holy name. It's an impossibility. And if a man is speaking by the Spirit, he is not going to denounce Jesus Christ or to blaspheme that holy name. And he said, as a matter of fact, if he is going to surrender to the Lordship, if he's going to call Jesus Lord, and that's more than just saying it. I'm telling you, there's a lot of sinner folks out there saying Jesus is Lord. There's a lot of folks who have plastered on their billboards that Jesus is Lord. That's not what the Apostle is talking about. He's talking about a man who calls him Lord in reality, who can say, he truly is Lord of my life, and that I've had an experience whereby I have surrendered and I've called upon the name of the Lord, and I have been saved, and he is the King of my life, and active present king who is leading and guiding my life. There is no man that can put uh, be in that state or that condition or that mindset and have the Lord as the Lord of his life and not be able to do that by the Spirit of God. He can only way that he is going to be able to truly acknowledge and experience the Lordship of Jesus Christ is by the Holy Ghost. All right, all right. Go ahead. So we understand there is this harmony between the Spirit and between Jesus Christ. You will not find the Godhead, one member of the Godhead, denying another member of the Godhead. There is this, again, an order and a unity in the Godhead. That's important for us to get and understand. And then he goes on to tell us, he talks about, uh, in verse 4, 5, and 6, he uses, there are two uh, different words translated, but it's the same Greek word. 
diversities. In verse 5, it's differences. In verse 6, diversities again. But it's the same Greek word, all three occasions. There are diversities of gifts, uh, but the same spirit. Here again uh, is the passage that does deal with the Trinity of God. There's the diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. And then there are diversities of operations or workings, but the same God. So there is a diversity of gifts. There are uh, various gifts that are given. However, they all come from the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations or ministries or services. This word administration here, it comes from that word deacon and is the idea of ministry. Jesus has given various gifts, ministry gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He has given these gifts and we have different ministries that are, have come to the church and that are, are active in the church. But there's only one Lord from whom those ministries ministry gifts come. There are various operations, manifestations, workings. There are various ways in which God works. There are various methods in which God uses. However, there is only one God. So what we see is we see variety and yet we see a sense of oneness and unity that is here. And it is possible for us to have diversity and yet have unity and oneness in the Godhead. Not oneness in the sense of that the Unitarian would declare, in the sense of solidarity, but oneness in the sense of unity. Oneness in the sense of purpose. Oneness in the sense of, of what God is going to do and who His being and who His nature is. And that is powerful and needful for you and I to understand because the God that indwells us indwells varied people of different personalities with different gifts and different callings and different talents. But it is the same God and order is possible in the church because we have one God who is over all men. And then he talks about the manifestation of the Spirit. It's given to every man for expedience to profit with all. The word profit here is the same word translated expedience or profitable. It's for profitability. If the Spirit of God and the manifestation of that Spirit in the church, the manifestation of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Here directly referring to the gifts of the Spirit later. He will talk about in the verses that are given. And the gifts are referred to as a manifestation of the Spirit. The gifts are not a manifestation of us. The gifts are not a manifestation of man. They are a manifestation of God. I'm telling you, if there's a bona fide healing that goes to, takes place in the church, it is a manifestation of the presence of God and the power of God among us as much as it was when Israel crossed the Red Sea. Glory to the Lamb of God. I'm telling you, when there's a message in tongues and an interpretation, it is a manifestation of the, of the presence and the power of God as much as the Shekinah glory that came down upon the the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Our God's a real God in the midst of a real people who manifest His glory and His presence among us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This manifestation that is given to every man, however, is for profit. It's for expedience. And then he lists the gifts. I'm not going to go through them, but he, he lists what is given, what manifestations are given. And he lists nine manifestations. We call them gifts, manifestation of the Spirit, either way you want to call it. But that's the idea and the context. And he goes and talks about that all of these work in verse 11, but all these work that one and the selfsame Spirit divide into every man severally as he will. But all these worketh. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The Spirit is doing two things. The Spirit is working and the Spirit is distributing the gifts. If we are seeing a true manifestation of these gifts that are identifiable within the church, then it is the work of the Spirit and it is the distribution of the Spirit among the believers of Jesus Christ. Now, He goes on to talk about how that now he has to emphasize this principle of unity. And again, it's going to play into this business of order that comes into that last part of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But he talks about you've got all these members. Have you ever seen a body that can have all its members in place and yes, yet that body is out of sync? The mind sends instruction to the hand, but there is some blockage or some 
nerve damage or there's something that has cut off that instruction or, or confused that instruction so that in the process of leaving the brain and getting to the hand, something happened to the message. The message got altered and, and the hand doesn't respond like it ought to. And you'll see people sometimes that, you know, that, that they may have been in an accident or something happened to them and they just, they can't control their body and they're just all out of sync and everything. And it's because that there's something inherently that's wrong. There's a disorder that's going on within that body. I'm telling you, we need to understand the church is the Lord's body. He intends to order that body. And you and I need to learn how to respond to Him and need to learn just who we are in Jesus Christ. And need to know that it's an order created by the Spirit and not by human organization. We can work with the Spirit, but it must initially be done by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't have time to go through all of this, and it's not my point that I want to make here this afternoon, but he talks about the, the members of the body and the comely members that are that we, we reveal, and the uncomely members that we cover up and place more honor on them, referring to our, uh, uh, the private members of our body. There are private aspects of our body that uh, are covered up, whether it be with clothing, whether it be with flesh. They are, they are covered up. The internal organs, quite frankly, are ugly. You ever see a heart? You know, we like to draw these nice little pretty red things, you know, that we just make them pretty. It doesn't look nothing like a real heart at all. That heart ain't nothing but an old floppy muscle. You lay that thing out there and it's just as ugly as ugly can be. But I'm going to tell you, it is vital to your existence. <laughs> yeah, and we really don't care whether it's pretty. We got it covered up with some skin and some bones. God covered it up and protected it. It wasn't too pretty to look at, but I tell you, it sure is necessary, isn't it? Amen. So there are uncomely parts that have necessary, and by the very fact that God covered them up, He placed more honor upon them. And he goes on, and that's the way it is in the body. And there are some parts that, quite frankly, that are there, are there are things, I'll be honest with you, sometimes there are things that we have to deal with in the membership that are quite ugly to deal with. And they don't need to be broadcast all over the world. They don't need to be told that body has to deal with it, that body has to understand with it. It becomes an internal issue. Let it be dealt with in an internal issue. And therefore, it's not something that the world needs to, needs to hear about. And that's what the brother was talking about this past Saturday. It's a problem that the church world has failed to police itself. And therefore, one of these days, the government's going to step in to police us. Because we've not policed our own members, our own ministers, and those who are, are failing to hold to the moral principles of God's Word. We are a body and we are responsible and our God is a God of order. Now, he deals again with that order. He talks about the order in verse 28. God has set them in the church. And he he talks about an order. There's first, there's second, there's third, and so forth and so on. And then he, he comes down in verse 30 of all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? I'd like to say something about verse 31 because in my understanding of the Scripture, my study of it, I, I believe this to be the, better, the best sense of that verse. Paul says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. The idea of best is the idea of that which is uh, um, better, excellent, that which is better. If you read it as it is, but covet earnestly the best gifts. It sounds as if Paul is, give, is giving them a command to do this, to desire the better gifts. I, that just doesn't fit to me with the context and the nature of Paul and also the nature of the Holy Spirit. Because what that tends to do is that tends to say that some gifts are more important than others and others are less and each of them have the proper context. Each of them are for different purposes. But I'm going to tell you, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I don't think Paul is ever going to give any hint that if it is properly a gift of the Holy Ghost and a manifestation of the Spirit, it's got to be good. And I don't think that we can say that there's one sense or one aspect of the Spirit that is truly better than the other. In certain situations, if we've got somebody that needs healed, 
then we don't really need tongues and interpretation. We need the gifts of healing. And I'm telling you, if the church is in dire straits and needs a word from God, we don't need a miracle. We need tongues and interpretation of prophecy. If we're in a situation where devils are around us and we've got, we've got difficult things and we're not sure which way to go, we don't so much need our faith and, and miracles. We need a word of knowledge. We need a word of wisdom. So there are gifts that are more appropriate and suited for different occasions, but one is not necessarily more valuable than the other. So that there is some scale of inherent value with them. Now, but this is a command, but I think it is more in the sense rather than being an imperative command, such as do this, but rather simply he is stating an indicative fact. How many of you understand even in the English language that sometimes the word you is understood? If I say to this young man, you know, come here. I don't say his name, I point and say come here, but it's understood you, come here. And it's an understood you, it's part of that command, but it is this idea, I think that Paul says, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but you covet earnestly the best gifts. But you covet earnestly the better gifts. Now there are some gifts that are more vocal. There are some gifts that are more attention getters. There are some gifts that may get you more notoriety or, or more exposure, if you will. And there were people that were putting one gift among uh, against another. And that's a problem that brings disorder. When we get that kind of putting one thing against another, let everything work in harmony. And we're not here to desire certain aspects of the ministry or the workings of the Spirit just so you and I can be noticed more than the man that sits next to us. Yeah, Paul says, not everybody has this and that, but look what you're doing. You're coveting the better gifts. You're coveting the gifts that are more manifest and more visible among you. Now notice, he says, I'm going to tell you the excellent way of that. I'm going to tell you the best way to do it. I'm going to tell you the way of excellence. This is what you're doing. I'm going to tell you the best way, what you really need to do. And you know how he goes through and he deals with this principle of love and how important it is for us to be filled with love. And to be motivated by love. He is not putting the gifts against love. He's telling us that let those gifts work in cooperation with love. In other words, let there be the fruit of the Spirit so that the gifts may be able to show their great value. But if we are lacking the fruit, we are going to have trouble with the gifts themselves. I'm not going to go through First Corinthians chapter 13, and you can you can look at it and what it is. But but he, he, again, he deals with this principle, inherent principle of love that comes down and is necessary in the sense of order in our lives, and that our God. Again, it's a God of order, and there is first things first. And I will tell you that there are first things that are first in the life that we do need to focus first on fruit and then the gifts. We need character that ought to be built within us, and then let the power of God be demonstrated in our lives in a great and useful way. Let there be a proper order in our lives so that we first build that nature of Jesus Christ, and then we move forward to see signs and wonders and great things happen to Pentecost and the men that God used after the day of Pentecost were not novices. They weren't Johnny come lately. They weren't lone rangers just off the dusty trail. These were men that had spent time in the presence of God incarnate and they knew what love was all about. They witnessed it firsthand at Calvary. They walked with God in shoe leather and said, this is a God and we can tell you what He's like. That God has been manifest and we can tell you God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Hallelujah. Now, First things first, know Jesus, know His nature, know His character, and then let us see gifts work and manifest it. I don't think that has to take a hundred years to get there either. I'm not suggesting you have to take ten years to focus on this. I'm just telling you there is some sense of order in our lives. Amen? And then it comes down to First Corinthians 14. And again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I just want to kind of give you a little overview of what's happening in this church and some of the things that Paul did and some of the things that he did not do. We got these folks and he talks and he begins to talk about tongues and now he's going to again focus on those speaking gifts. Tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Three gifts are going to be dealt with in chapter 14. The other six gifts are not going to be dealt with, are not going to be regulated, and are not going to be mentioned. He's going to be dealing with these three gifts that involve speaking and talking in the church. And he talks with them and he says that uh, desire spiritual things, rather that you may prophesy. And then he begins to compare. 
And let us understand that if we are not careful, we will read this passage. When you are dealing with an, I venture to say, maybe a more not so much an abuse, but a misuse or misunderstanding. People's concepts are wrong. Their understanding of God's working in a, in a gift and, and how it should work and how it should operate. Their understanding of the character and nature of God inherently it is flawed. If Paul wants to deal with something that would be more beneficial in this group, he wants them when they come together, he wants some value, some benefit to come out of that. He wants people to be edified. He wants that after there's been an assembly, that the people will go home and leave that assembly edified and strengthened and built up. I'm telling you, a world of chaos, we need order. And the one place we ought to find order is the house of God. Woo, hallelujah. Out there ought to be the confusion. In here ought to be clarity. Out there ought to be the whole who knows what's up. But in here we ought to say we know where we're going and where we're headed. We are God's people on our way to glory. And God is ordering our lives on a daily basis. And so, now he... He begins to talk about this. And as I say, if you're not careful, you'll begin to think, well, Paul is really down in tongues. Again... Paul is not going to speak critically or negative against a bona fide manifestation and gift of the Spirit of God. The way some people talk about tongues, you would almost think they're demonic. Folks, that right there is kin to blasphemy. I mean, you are on the verge of blasphemy. I'd be afraid to stand in the presence of a man talking like that. You know, you're looking for lightning to strike about anywhere, anywhere else. We're talking about, read First Corinthians chapter 12. The gift of tongues is a manifestation of the Holy God of heaven that was come and descended at Pentecost. Tell me how that manifestation can be evil and that how God could commission an apostle who would criticize and degrade tongues and push it somewhere into antiquity. That is not his purpose. And I think he understands some folks are going to get the wrong, the wrong idea. So he, he tells us two or three times throughout the passage. He tells us, you need guys to understand I'm not down in tongues. I speak with tongues more than all of you. He even ends the passage. Do not stop a man from speaking in tongues. On and on. He talks about it. There are there's other places that he mentions, but, but he, he keeps writing this. Though. I, I'm just trying to bring a principle here that y'all are missing something about the manifestation of the Spirit. There's something that's out of sync and out of order in your services. So now he begins to say, and begins to tell the purpose of tongues. And tongues working well, tongues working on an individual basis, provides edification for an individual, and it's man speaking to God. Tongues alone are not man speaking to man. They are man speaking to God. And don't worry about it with God, because He knows all languages. And it's the Spirit that speaks anyway. <laughs> so God knows God. Amen. And, and, and they have that kind of business. Don't confuse that as well with uh, the day of Pentecost. And we see it other places. And, and it may take place in the context of prayer. It may take place in the context of praise and worship. But again, it is not something directed to the church. It is something directed to God. And I can tell you right now, when you're talking to God, you can talk in any legitimate language. If it is indeed the Spirit of God speaking, then let Him speak. And you will not understand what is being said. But I promise you, the Spirit declares it, the Word declares it, and you'll know it if it happens in you, you will be edified. You will be blessed. You will be strengthened by that. And you will be lifted up because that is the explicit trust that we have placed in the Holy Ghost to say, Holy Ghost, I don't have to understand what you say. I know whatever you say is good. I know whatever you speak is right. And I have explicitly put my trust in you. And you can speak to me whatever you will. And I'm not afraid of what's going to be said. Right. If it's in a language someone else understands, so be it. It'll be right. If it's not in a language that anybody on earth understands, so be that. It'll still be right. And he talks about again how he's, he speaks in the Spirit mysteries. No man understands him. But then he says the man that prophesies. And again, he's just comparing the two. The man that prophesies, he doesn't speak to God. He's speaking for God and he's speaking to men. Speaking to the church. And he says that the one that speaks in the unknown tongue, verse 4, he edifies himself, but the one that prophesies, he edifies the church. And that's a problem that we've got in Corinth. We've got a problem with a lot of self-edification 
in and of itself and in a proper context is not something that's evil. But when that is, when there's self-edification at the expense of the edification of the body, we've got a problem going on. We've got something that needs to be put in place and needs to be ordered and out of harmony. It's out of harmony and needs to be placed in sync. Notice again, Paul, he wants to make sure we're not down in tongues. Verse 5, I would that you all spoke with tongues. Can I say that to everybody in this church? I would that you all spoke with tongues. Or rather that you prophesied. That's what Paul said. He's not, again, trying to say that one's negative, get rid of this one, or this one's better than another. But he said, when it comes to this body, you know, I would you all spoke with tongues. But you know what? I'll be quite frank with you. You can have both. But you can prophesy. And you can speak in tongues too. But he said, I would that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues except the interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, greater in what sense? Again, let's understand this language. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll play a, a Jehovah's Witness thing here. We'll get that kind of mindset that Jehovah's Witness have in John chapter 14. said, well, Jesus can't be equal to the Father because He said, I go to my Father and my Father is greater than I. And since the Father is greater than Jesus Christ, therefore Jesus must be less than the Father. Wrong! Right. Wrong understanding of greater! In that context, he's not saying J- Jesus is less than the Father, but that's a problem. If we look at it that way, we, we tend to look at that and say, well, greater means one's greater than the other. That means this one's better than that. That means that the guy's prophesying is a better man than him that's speaking in tongues. Not true at all. Paul's not saying that at all. Greater in what context? Greater in the sense of being able to edify the body. Yes. When you talk about greater, you have to define the context of greater. When you talk about it in John 14, in what sense is the Father greater than Jesus? Well, Jesus, at the right hand of the Father, will be able to do more for us on earth than He would had He remained here. That's the sense of greater. Jesus says, if I go there, if I'm restored to my former glory, and I go there, then I can do more. I can send the Spirit and more can happen than I can in my present state, in my present condition. And in this context, Paul says when it comes to edifying the body, the man that prophesies to that body is greater than the man who simply speaks in tongues, unless the man speaking in tongues also interprets the message that is given to the church. Are you with me? Say amen. Verse 6 gives us the, the right sense that we've got to get in this passage. My brethren, if I come unto you, speaking with tongues. Some people want to, again, they want to read this passage, get down on tongues, throw tongues out, negate the gift of the Holy Ghost, and, and say there should be no tongues in the service whatsoever. The only person that I know is going to say that is someone who's never experienced tongues. Because I'm telling you, if you've ever felt and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak with tongues. And you ever speak with tongues, I'm going to tell you, there isn't any way in the world you ever want to shut that part out of a service and a time when the saints come together. You want the Spirit of God to have free reign and you want people to be able to be filled with the Spirit and let the Spirit of God speak and give utterance among them. But there is yet in that sense some order and there's a purpose to the gift and it needs to be understood. So he says, it's if I come to you. That's the context in which Paul was saying that the use of tongues is out of order. If I come to you speaking in tongues. If I'm speaking to you, if I'm speaking to God, it's not out of order. If I'm praying and praising God in the context of a worship service and people are worshiping and people are praying in the altar and we folks are supposed to be focused on God. If I'm praying, you really don't need to be listening to my prayer. Now, if it's a context that I'm praying over an offering or something and we know we're all listening and we got a man praying, you need to pray in a language that folks can understand. We understand that because we're kind of listening and we're going to say ditto to that prayer. But there comes a wonderful thing that's taking place in Pentecost. And that is that a lot of folks, they, they struggle with this context again because they've never had a Pentecostal experience in their churches. I mean, nobody speaks more. Uh, there's only one person speaking at a time and, and, and they don't have a, a context in, in which people uh, pray together. I mean, you go, uh, I've been in places, you get in, in, in amongst them of these people and you get three or four people that pray at one time and they're just, they're just unnerved by it. And I'm, not, I'm not being critical of that. I'm just telling you it's because they've not been used to and not had that Pentecostal experience. On the day of Pentecost, he filled all 120 of them at the same time. 120 people speaking at the same time. 
He didn't fill one and let them speak and then fill another one. That would have taken a long time. Wouldn't 120 folks all speak in one? They all spoke at one time. I'm telling you, it was a noise that erupted in that upper room that day when the power of God filled that house and the Spirit came. They all began to speak, the Bible said. They all began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit of God gave the other. And it was a praise and worship service where everybody is glorifying God at one time without any confusion and any disorder. Please understand, we're not talking about where somebody that's ignorant and unlearned might get confused. The ignorant are always confused until they learn better. There's a lot of phony things that we do that ignorant and unlearned people don't understand about. What are you doing down there baptizing them in water? What's that all about? That looks weird. That looks crazy. What are you doing? And, and we're so far removed from that and people don't do it or we hide it away in the baptistry. And I'm not against baptistries. I wish we had one. Uh, or at least a place we could consistently baptize people. But I do like that old-fashioned river because it is a public testimony to the world out there. Hey, there's still a church in America. Hey, there's still a church around here and we still believe in baptizing people in water. And thank God we've still got some converts that are, that are converting to Jesus Christ. But the world doesn't understand that. The further we get away from Christianity in this nation, the less they're going to understand those things and, and ask those questions. So we're not talking about some ignorant person that walks in the street and never had an experience like that. Saying, well, I don't understand what's going on. Well, you won't understand what's going on until you get a hold of God and get filled with the power of the Lord, get saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and then you'll get some understanding. Even then, you're going to need taught, but start at first base. Don't try to go to third base when you've never even started at the right place. Right. Give me just a few more minutes here this evening. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. You know, so the problem is, if I'm in, or let me say that if I'm in a context of a praise and worship where people aren't focused on listening to the person beside them and they're just caught up in Worshiping God. I think that's a wonderful thing in Pentecost. I do. And I, I just think it's a wonderful thing to, just to be caught up with saints. Do you know what? When we get to heaven, it's going to be that way. We're not going to get to heaven and just have two or three people or one person speaking at one time. Man, the whole crowd falls on their face. Start to lift up God. Pray. Can you imagine the voice of the millions of saints crying out in the throne room of God? Woo! Brother John, we are going to have a time, aren't we? Hallelujah. My, what a time that's going to be. And it's going to be a wonderful thing. It's going to be a wonderful thing, but if I'm in that context where we're speaking to God, then, then, and the Spirit of God speaks through me. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. We have people in this church that are of different languages, and you might have people in the, in the early church, they had people in there that spoke several languages, that had learned, learned languages, not languages by the Holy Ghost, but learned languages. And, and, and quite frankly, I've found that I've been around folks. I've, I've, I've listened to some of the Hispanics in this church, and when I, when I get around them and they start praying, they don't launch out in, in English. Sometimes I will hear them say some words in English because they're trying to fit in and do some things. But whenever they get focused on God, they leave English because it's not comfortable with them. And they go with the language that is comfortable with them. I do that when I'm in Mexico. There's sometimes I pray as much as I can to, to pray with those folks and pray in Spanish. But when the Holy Ghost comes, I'm telling you, I leave Spanish and go to speak in English because I give glory to God. I'm more comfortable with that language and it just comes out more natural. I can express my heart in a greater way. And all oh, by the words, they don't understand you. It's not for them. This is unto the Lord God. But if I'm addressing you, just like I'm doing tonight, if I'm talking to you, I need to do it in a language you can understand. Or you're not going to get anything out of it. That's the context. It's not the idea that Paul meant to eliminate tongues from the service. No. Just put it in its proper order. Put it in its proper order. Put it where it belongs. Understand the nature of it. Understand the purpose of it. It's a common sense, simple principle. When you're talking to somebody and you're addressing a person, you want them to benefit from what you're saying. And that means they need to understand. And that goes beyond. 
That goes beyond, and that includes more than just simply speaking their language, but using even words that they can comprehend and understand. If you come and you speak on an educational level above the people or above your audience, and sometimes you may need to teach them things and, and lift your audience a little bit and challenge them, but for the general part, you need to put it out on the level people can get a hold of it and grasp it. What's stealing going? You may be speaking the same language, but if it's not the same language, if you understand what I'm saying, I mean, I've been around folks that talk about something on the computer or this. I know they're speaking English. I understand the words that they are saying, but I'm telling you, what they're saying doesn't compute. Because I don't know the language of computers, or I don't know the language of automobiles, or I don't know the language of architecture, or I don't know the language of whatever business that they're in. So it's more than just simply words being able to understood, but concepts and ideas as well that have to be communicated. When we're talking with people, talk to them in a way so they can grasp what you're saying. Hallelujah to God. Whew. Stand to your feet. I'm, i got a long ways to go. And I just feel the Lord wants me to stop us here. God willing, I'll pick it up Sunday afternoon. If God will, and if He doesn't will, we'll come back to it when He does. But We are Pentecostals, are we not? And I know there's a world out there that doesn't, doesn't like us. They don't understand us. I'm not worried about that. Amen. None of the world understood Noah either. That's right. Amen. But if he'd have let that bother him, we wouldn't be here today. Right. We'd be in trouble. But he built that ark no matter who understood it, no matter who liked it. He built that ark. And I, I'm going to emphasize with you in the next sermon or two, whatever it takes me to cover this in lesson, I want to teach it, I want to share it with you, that God wants to put your life in order. And there are times in our lives He wants to put our church in order. He wants to put our homes in order. Yes. And there are times we get out of sync. There are times when there are inconsistencies in our life. There's some inward attitude that's inconsistent. Or some outward work or some outward appearance. Jesus. We want God to put our life in a complete wholeness and harmony. Right. Amen. Yes. And He's going to do it if we're letting Him. Because He's a God of order. He's got peace. Hallelujah. Woo, praise the Lamb of God. If you don't feel good, I feel good for you. Amen. Praise God. Would you just lift your hand and give God thanks tonight. Father God in heaven, I just thank you tonight, God, for being able to be here tonight. I just thank you for your word. Lord, it excites me. It thrills me, Lord. It makes me happy. I just pray You'd help me, Lord, to teach and share with this congregation. And, and Lord, the things that You put in my heart, God, that You'd help me, Lord, to share with them so that, Lord, our lives can be arranged. Our lives can be put in order. Our lives can be brought to the place, Lord, where everything is in harmony. Lord, take out the inconsistencies. Take out the things, Lord God, and show us in our lives, in our homes, in our church, in our individual lives, in our We know there's much disorder in the country, but God, that order's never going to come until we get it right in our own hearts, get it right in our homes, get it right in our churches. And then, Lord, we can reach out and touch a world that's around us. Order us. Order us, Lord. Lord, now there's turmoil in this world. There ought to be peace in here. Though there's turmoil, Lord, in the lives of sinners, our lives ought to be a life of peace because our steps are ordered, our steps are directed, our lives are purposeful, and we know where we're going, and we know why we're going there, and what we are doing, and why we are doing it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because you are not of confusion, but you are of peace, O Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You are not of confusion. You are of peace. Hallelujah. And I thank you for that principle. Oh, hallelujah. And Holy Ghost, I'm asking you to order this church. Whatever may be out of sync or out of harmony, put it in order, Lord. So that we can march forth with a sense of unity and harmony. Dear Lord, that will cause us to be able to be, have a unified presentation to this world. Woo! That we are one people, oh, united in Jesus Christ, baptized into His body by the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you for it, Lord. 
God, keep us. Strengthen your people this week. Heal those that are yet sick and afflicted. And bring us back, Lord. I pray if you tarry, Lord, here to labor Saturday and then Sunday in service, Lord, as the prelude to the camp meeting. I pray that Holy Ghost power will just be manifest in this church. We want, Lord, that manifestation of the Spirit. We want more than a manifestation of the speaking gifts. But God, set us in order. And Lord, let us see a manifestation of the Spirit in other areas that needs to be seen for the edification of the church and for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. Mm, hallelujah. Woo. And I'm going to give you praise, Father. Amen. 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 God bless you, saints. God bless you tonight. Go in His peace.